So in chapter one of the book, we include a series of case studies highlighting common challenges we have observed in our experience, in our collective experience. The case studies span from early career data scientists who recently entered this exciting field to mid-stage folks who are beginning to lead teams to mature leaders who head up functions and hold executive roles. Let's take a closer look at one of them. We're gonna talk about Paul. As a graduate of a highly selective data science fellowship program, Paul was recruited by and spent three years at a global internet company focused on revenue and retention optimization for a mature product line. He considers himself very fortunate to have worked for an exceptional manager who he looked up to and aspired to be one to be one himself one day. Six months ago, Paul's opportunity came. One of his classmates from graduate school days, Sam, who heads up operations research at a late stage bio stage biotech st startup, recruited Paul to manage the data science team. Paul really welcomed the opportunity and was confident that his experience and learning from a much larger group and the company had prepared him well for this role. So technically strong, Paul also invests significant effort in building relationships with the data science team. In addition to project related meetings, Paul sets up weekly walks, no, online walks, with each of the seven team members. He holds weekly office hours to make sure he's available for the team, especially when the challenges arise, and hosts breakfast with data science in an effort to communicate frequently with project stakeholders and business partners to listen to their needs and keep them informed. So six months in, Paul feels drained, yet business results are only mixed at best. Out of the five main projects his team is on, two are chugging along, two are delayed, and one has changed scopes entirely. The, there are also a few pet projects that haven't even taken off. It seems like Paul's efforts have really not paid off as much as he had anticipated. Is he doing the right things? Or is this a case of facing reality after passing the initial honeymoon phase? How can Paul develop into a good manager? So this is a pretty representative case. I think um, I've mentored many Pauls in the various roles I've taken. And you may recognize a Paul uh, near you. Paul feels trained after six months on the job, and his effort has only less, led to a mixed result. Now, as a manager in a new company, Paul knew that what he needs to do to get accepted in a new environment. So he was very good at relationship building, for example. Um, he took on requests uh, from teams and business partners, but the challenge looks to be that he became overwhelmed about all the requests he took on. And what's showing up for the team and the business partners is that Paul took on too many projects and it shows up as having little leadership on where to focus. So in this book, we lay out the path for data scientists to reach for the next stage of their career. And this path include understanding the expectations and assessing opportunities that leads to the next role. So what could be a really helpful process for Paul in this case? Well, first we wanna build confidence. So we want to recognize the leadership strength that Paul already has. And then we wanna highlight his personal path or the opportunities for new practices that he can adopt. And in order for Paul to be success successful, it's not just him, it's also lever leveraging the organization that's around him. And also having a clear roadmap for him to be able to adopt many of the new practices and incorporate it in his daily work. So how do you get the most from checking out a case like this? Well, um, well, first, what you can potentially do is to see how you can measure up to Paul's strength and see if you have similar opportunities for new practices or if you have alternative solutions uh, that could even work better, uh, work even better in your case. 
and see if you have similar kind of support in your organization for people to, who reports to you and pe for people who you reports to. And then you can also start lining up your own roadmap to see if you can incorporate some of these new practices. With this, shall we look at Paul's strength first? Yeah, let's look at Paul's strength first. For Paul's strength, we noted that uh, he's got a PhD in statistics, so there is some pretty rigorous training in the scientific methods. And he also went through a uh, data science fellowship which provides him with a pretty good breadth of data science knowledge. Now, what we can see is that he can have the uh, capability to frame the problem, to maximize business impact, discover patterns in data, right? And also he could be effective in project execution. So we'll share some of his strengths in striking balances between trade-offs. And also, his three year at a global internet company has provided him valuable work experience where he has uh, experienced the drive for consistency across models and projects. So let's go through those carefully one by one. Now, for Paul's strength in asking the questions, the right questions in framing the problem, is analysis limited? to historical data? Or are there real-time streaming data sources that must be considered? Now, these are all the kind of questions that should be asked when framing a problem. Now, with the answers he has, for example, uh, whether the problem is a diagnostic-only uh, problem or the results should be predictive of the future, he can create these four quadrants in using these dimensions uh, to be able to look at what is the specific opportunity calls for. So for example, um, let's take a case with uh, a set of email uh, and marketing campaigns that's targeted to invoke long-term engagement. Well, a typical, uh, a typical approach could be um, running an A-B test with a set of holdout set uh, and where the holdout group uh, of users don't see the email campaign. And you can run this test for a few months and then assess whether the lack of marketing campaigns impact long-term engagement. But this is a kind of hindsight with a long experimentation cycle that's not really efficient in generating improvements in operations. Well, what kind of insight can we provide? Well, with a real-time dashboard illustrating the trends in long-term engagement, we can follow the decays in uh, long-term engagement across multiple uh, user vintages to detect early trends of success and failures. Uh, and this, these trends can allow organizations to make business decisions in real-time uh, from the dashboard, but it's not enough. What really what we want is also to have foresight. Now, given Historical data, we can build up a model uh, that predicts long-term engagement using short-term engagement characteristics, like open rates, click-through rates, unsubscribe rates, landing page session length, etc. And a predictive model can anticipate long-term effect with short-term observations. So we can gain the foresight to adjust uh, our email campaigns uh, week to week. What more can we do? Well, we can leverage intelligence capabilities, right? We can include real-time analytics on channels such as email to learn about our customer segments. And then we can prepare sequences of touches on the next best action to drive long-term engagement for specific segments of users. And when we can adopt and adapt the content of the next touches based on the individual responses in real time, we now begin to see the intelligence in driving long-term engagement. So you can see by framing the problem with different levels of data science capabilities, and the in, we can uh, take the business impact from just analyzing an A-B test readout to automated dashboards, to agile operations, to leading the long-term engagement initiative with intelligence features in the user experience. So Paul, can do all this and 
this is a quite important strength for a data science leader. And you can find more in-depth discussions of these topics in the book in, in section 2.1.1. And we'll highlight that at the top right corner of the slide as we go through these descriptions of Paul's strengths and opportunities. With the strengths in technical capabilities, we can also uh, discover the patterns in data. And that includes understanding data characteristics like the unit of decisioning, sample size, data sparsity, outliers, etc. Or uh, looking at uh, the innovations in feature engineering, like you know, with simple statistics, complex statistics, clustering analysis, graph analysis, and uh, clarifying modeling strategies like the momentum-based strategies, foundational strategies, reflexive strategies, as well as hybrid strategies. So you can find out a bit more about these in section 2.1.2 in the book. Now, uh, Paul's strengths is not only his technical capabilities. He also has some strong execution capabilities. And these strong uh, execution capabilities uh, comes from the capability of making trade-offs uh, to make uh, balanced trade-offs between speed and quality, between safety and accountability, documentation and progress. Now, what do we mean by those? Well, what we mean is that for speed and quality, um, as a manager of project, Paul must understand when to practice the art of craftsmanship and when to quickly empower a business partner to make a timely business decision. So, for example, when the business decision is at the go or no-go granularity, Paul can guide the team towards speed. If the uh, business problem is making incremental improvements that can result in significant business impact, then Paul can guide the team to uh, emphasize quality. Well, what we mean by balancing safety and accountability? Well, problems occur, uh, sites can go down, go down, and models can fail. So uh, regardless of how carefully we planned and executed our data science projects, uh, they're still uh, prone to failures from unknown risks. And these unknown risks uh, are coming from new teams, new processes, new platforms. And to fail is human. What's important is how we learn from that process and how we don't make the same, so we don't make the same mistakes again. Now, this learning process in different organizations can be called uh, postmortems, learning reviews, after action reviews, or incident reviews. But the important piece is to figure out how to go through these processes without assigning blames. What does that mean? Well, to learn from our past, we need first an accurate account of what happened, what effect was observed, what's expected, and what were the assumptions made. Now, suppose the data scientist or the business partner believed that they would be punished from this process. They may not open up to share the true nature of the mechanisms, the pathologies, and the operations of the failures so that the team cannot truly learn from those failures. Now, what about balancing documentation and progress? Documentation is hard topic, right? Uh, because it's often seen as competing with making new progress on additional projects. So if you have grown a team, you know, without sufficient documentation, onboarding new team members can be highly inefficient. And you may have observed new team members and existing team members getting stuck over similar challenges for days while best practices already exist in the team. Now, good documentation doesn't have to be long and nuanced, but it does have to satisfy the following three conditions. So it needs to be reproducible, transferable, and discoverable. And we discuss more of those requirements in section 2.2.3 in the book. Other than the 
project management, uh, the project uh, execution capabilities. There is also the project management capabilities. And you may have seen this scenario play out in teams you are involved in. Um, when you investigate the cause of uh, these uh, uh, challenges, uh, like so the, the challenges uh, can be uh, the data science team has been successful in working through some proof of concept project and have quick wins, uh, but gradually uh, the progress slows to a crawl. Now, what, that, what often happens is that you've encountered issues in creating tech decks. Now, there are common uh, methodologies to be able to mitigate this process, uh, including uh, providing a common A-B test framework, a common dashboarding and reporting infrastructure, and common data uh, enrichment infrastructure, as well as common metrics to be able to allow the team to get back in track. And these we discuss in section 4.1.2. So these are Paul's strengths. Now, where are Paul's uh, opportunities for new practice? As you can see, this different strength areas fall into different chapters and different sections. So we'll give you a guide as to how to use this in both in Paul's journey as well as in your journey, which may be similar or very different from Paul's journey that's taking place right now.